Our record can reflect that all our jurors have returned, so good morning. Uh, you won't have to take notes anymore. Our note taking's done uh, because we're not going to be hearing any more uh, evidence. What we'll hear this morning is the jury instructions that I will give to you. As I told you, when you go back and deliberate, each of you will have your own copy of these instructions to refer to. Uh, after that, we'll hear the closing arguments of the attorneys. Remember what the attorneys say are not evidence. Uh, it's only their perception of what the evidence was. It's up to you as the jury to make these determinations. For example, on credibility and applying the law to the facts or applying the facts to the law. Uh, that'll be up to y'all to do that. So in just a minute, I'm going to read these instructions to you. Uh, we'll put them up on the screen. Uh, sometimes I'll read a little fast. I apologize for that. I'll try to slow down. But as I said, y'all each will get a copy of these instructions uh, once you begin your deliberation, along with a number of the exhibits. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. After I finish that, uh, then we'll go into closing arguments. And the way closing arguments works is the state goes first, then the defense, then the state. The reason the state goes twice is because they've got that burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the reason they get to go twice. And my, what I think we'll do is I'll do instructions. We'll let the state do its uh, closing argument. Then we'll probably take about a 10-minute break. Then we'll let the defense make its closing argument. Then we'll take a 10-minute break. And then we'll go ahead and let the state finish. And then at that time, I'll give you some instructions about your deliberations and then how you can handle those. Uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to get to you this morning or maybe early this afternoon. We'll probably just press on through, and then I'll let you as the jury make a determination if you want to go eat lunch, if you want to go work for a while, that'll be kind of up to y'all. As I said, we'll talk about that once we get to that part of the uh, trial. It's important to listen carefully to these instructions, but as I said, you'll get a copy of those at the uh, conclusion of the case. So, Ms. Kimbrough, if we can put those up on the screen, please. Thank you. The evidence in this case has been completed, and it's my duty now to instruct you as to the law. You'll recall that I gave you preliminary instructions when the trial began. Those instructions, as well as instructions I'm giving now, will provide you the law applicable in this case. It is your duty to carefully consider them. The order in which these instructions are given is no indication of their relative importance. You should not single out any one or more of them to the exclusion of another or others, but should consider each one in light of and in harmony with others. As I said, earlier in these proceedings, the court gave you a portion of its jury charge. Each of you will be given a copy of this preliminary charge as well as these concluding jury instructions. Equal weight is to be given to all instructions regardless of when they were presented to you. The defendant, Ms. Madden, is charged in the count one of the indictment with first-degree murder. This offense necessarily includes the lesser offenses of second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, reckless homicide, and criminally negligent homicide. The defendant is also charged in count two of the indictment with tampering with evidence. This offense necessarily includes the lesser offense of attempted tamper with evidence. The defendant pleads not guilty to each and every offense embraced in the indictment. The guilt of the defendant, as well as any fact required to be proven, may be established by direct evidence, by circumstantial evidence, or by both combined. Direct evidence is defined as evidence which proves the existence of the fact and issue without inference or presumption. Direct evidence may consist of testimony of a person who has perceived by the means of his or her senses the existence of a fact sought to be proved or disproved. Circumstantial evidence consists of proof of collateral facts and circumstances which do not directly prove the fact and issue, but from which the fact may be logically inferred. For example, if a witness testified the witness saw it rain outside, that would be direct evidence that it was raining. If a witness testified that the witness saw someone enter a room wearing a, a raincoat covered with drops of water and carrying a wet umbrella, that would be circumstantial evidence from which you could conclude that it was raining. It is your duty to decide how much weight to give the direct and circumstantial evidence. The law makes no distinction between the weight that you should give to either one or say that one is any better evidence than the other. You should consider all the evidence, both direct and circumstantial, and give it whatever weight you believe it deserves. First degree murder. Any person who commits the offense of first degree murder is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant unlawfully killed the alleged victim. And two, the defendant acted intentionally. A person acts intentionally 
when it is the person's conscious objective or desire to cause the death of the alleged victim. And three, the killing was premeditated. A premeditated act is one done after the exercise of reflection and judgment. Premeditation means the intent to kill must have been formed prior to the act itself. It is not necessary that the purpose to kill pre-exist in the mind of the accused for any period, any definite period of time. The mental state of the accused at the time she allegedly decided to kill must be carefully considered in order to determine whether the accused was sufficiently free from excitement and passion as to be capable of premeditation. If the, divine, if the design to kill was formed with premeditation, it is immaterial the accused may have been in a state of passion or excitement when the design was carried into effect. Furthermore, premeditation can be found if the decision to kill is first formed during the heat of passion, but the accused commits the act after the passion has subsided. A lesser included of that is second-degree murder. Any person who commits second-degree murder is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant unlawfully killed the alleged victim, and two, the defendant acted knowingly. Knowingly means that a person acts with the awareness that her conduct is reasonably certain to cause the death of the alleged victim. The requirement of knowingly is also established if it is shown the defendant acted intentionally. Intentionally has previously been defined in these instructions. The distinction between voluntary manslaughter and second-degree murder is that voluntary manslaughter requires the killing result from a state of passion produced by adequate provocation sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act in an irrational manner. The next lesser included offense is voluntary manslaughter. Any person who commits voluntary manslaughter is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant unlawfully killed the alleged victim, and two, the defendant acted knowingly, and three, the killing resulted from a state of passion produced by adequate provocation sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act in an irrational manner. The term knowingly, as well as the distinction between voluntary manslaughter and second-degree murder, have previously been defined in these instructions. The next lesser included offense is reckless homicide. Any person who commits the offense of reckless homicide is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant killed the alleged victim, and two, the defendant acted recklessly. Recklessly means that a person acts recklessly when a person is aware of but consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk the alleged victim would be killed. The risk must be of such a nature and, and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the accused person's standpoint. The requirement of recklessly is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted intentionally or knowingly. These terms were also previously defined in these instructions. The next lesser included offense is criminally negligent homicide. Any person who commits criminally negligent homicide is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the essential following elements. One, the defendant's conduct resulted in the death of the alleged victim, and two, the defendant acted with criminal negligence. Criminal negligence means that a person acts with criminal negligence when the person ought to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the alleged victim would be killed. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances viewed from the accused person's standpoint. The requirement of criminal negligence is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, and these terms were previously defined in these instructions. If you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was criminally negligent, you must also find the death of the alleged victim was the proximate result of the defendant's criminal negligence. The defendant's actions need not be the sole or immediate cause of death. If you find the direct cause of death was an act of the victim before you can convict the defendant, you must also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the act of the victim causing the death was a natural and probable result of the defendant's criminal negligence. Count two is the charge of tampering with evidence. Any, any person who tampers with evidence is guilty of a crime. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt 
the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant knew an investigation was in progress. And two, the defendant concealed a thing to wit a cutting instrument with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in the investigation. Thing means an object or an entity not precisely designated or capable of being designated. Knowingly, as, result, as relevant to count two, means that a person acts knowingly with respect to the conduct or to the circumstances surrounding the conduct when the person is aware of the nature of the conduct or that the circumstance exists. A person acts knowingly with respect, with respect to the result of the person's conduct when the person is aware that the conduct is reasonably certain to cause the result. The requirement of knowingly is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted intentionally. Intentionally means that a person acts intentionally with respect to the nature of the conduct or to result of the conduct when it is the person's conscious objective or desire to engage in the conduct or cause the result. A lesser included offense of that charge is attempted tampering with evidence. Any person who attempts to commit a criminal offense is guilty of a crime. If we define a person guilty of criminal attempt, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, the defendant intended to commit the specific offense of tampering with evidence. And two, the defendant did some act intended to complete a course of action or cause a result that would constitute tampering with evidence or the circumstances as the defendant believed them to be at the time, and her actions constitute a substantial step towards the commission of tampering with evidence. The defense actions do not constitute a substantial step unless the defense entire course of action clearly shows her intent to commit tampering with evidence. The essential elements necessary to constitute tampering with evidence have previously been set out in these instructions. Order of consideration. When you begin your deliberations, you must first deliberate on the indicted offense. If you find the defendant guilty of the indicted offense, you may stop your deliberations. If you find the defendant not guilty of the indicted offense, or you have a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty of the indicted offense, and next consider the lesser included offenses as set out below in your verdict form. If you are unable to reach a unanimous verdict as to an offense, please notify my court officer, Ms. Kimbrough. The defendant is charged in count one with first degree murder. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, you may stop your deliberations, report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of first-degree murder, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt of first-degree murder, next consider the lesser-included charge, lesser-included offense of second-degree murder. If you, if you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder, you, must, you may stop your deliberations as this count, report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimous, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of second-degree murder, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt on second-degree murder, next consider the lesser-included offense of voluntary manslaughter. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of voluntary, voluntary manslaughter, you may stop your deliberations, report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of voluntary manslaughter, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt on voluntary manslaughter, next consider the lesser included offense of reckless homicide. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of reckless homicide, you may stop your deliberations as to this count, report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of reckless homicide, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt on reckless homicide, next consider the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide, you may stop your deliberations, report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of criminally negligent homicide, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt on criminally negligent homicide, you must acquit the defendant on this count report your verdict on the verdict form, and proceed to count two. The defendant is charged in count two of the indictment with tampering with evidence. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence, you may stop your deliberations and report your verdict on the verdict form, thereby con concluding your deliberations. If, on the other hand, you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant not guilty of tampering with evidence, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt on tampering with evidence, next consider the lesser-included offense of attempted tampering with evidence. 
if you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of attempted tampering with evidence, you might, I'm sorry, if you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of attempted tampering with evidence, you must acquit the defendant on this count and report your verdict form. I think that's incorrect. Let me repeat that. If you, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of attempted tampering with evidence, then you should find him guilty on this count and then report that on your verdict form. If you find him not guilty, then you should report that on your verdict form as well. That would conclude your uh, deliberations. In considering the charged offenses or lesser included offenses in this case, you are not to concern yourself with punishment. In the event of a guilty verdict on any of the charges, all sentencing issues are to be decided by the court. The jury does not take any part. The jury does not take part in sentencing. In the event you think you have heard any information, or you think you have any perception as to what the sentence would be, you should disregard it. The defendant, having testified in her own behalf, her credibility is determined by the same rules by which the credibility of other witnesses is determined, and you'll give her testimony such weight as you think it's entitled. Included in the defense plea of not guilty is her plea of self-defense. If a defendant was not engaged in unlawful activity and was in a place where she had the right to be, she would have no duty to retreat before threatening or using force against the deceased twin and to the degree the defendant reasonably believed the force was immediately necessary to protect against the deceased use of unlawful force. If a defendant was not engaged in unlawful activity and was in a place where she had the right to be, she would also have no duty to retreat before threatening or using force intended or likely to cause death if the defendant had a reasonable belief that there was imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. The danger creating the belief of imminent death or serious bodily injury was real or honestly believed to be real at the time, and the belief of danger was founded upon reasonable grounds. In determining whether the defense use of force in the defendant herself is reasonable, you may consider not only her use of force, but also all the facts and circumstances surrounding and leading up to it. Factors to consider in deciding whether there was reasonable grounds for defense to fear serious bodily injury from the deceased include, but are not limited, to the animosity of the deceased or the defendant as revealed to the defendant by previous acts and words of the deceased, and the manner in which the parties were armed and their relative strengths and sizes. The use of force against the deceased would not have been justified if the defendant provoked the deceased use of unlawful force unless the defendant abandoned the encounter or clearly communicated to the deceased the intent to do so, and the deceased nevertheless continued to use unlawful force against the defendant. The use of force against another is not justified if the defendant consented to the exact force used by the other, other individual. Force means compulsion by the use of physical power or violence. Violent means evidence of physical force unlawfully exercised as to damage, damage injure, or abuse and physical contact is not required to prove violence. Unlawfully pointing a deadly weapon at an alleged victim is physical force directed towards the body of a victim. Imminent means near at hand or on the point of happening. Serious bodily injury means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death, protracted unconsciousness, extreme physical pain, protracted or obvious disfigurement, or protracted or loss of a substantial impairment of a function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. If evidence is introduced supporting self-defense, the burden is on the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. If from all the facts and circumstances you find the defendant act in self-defense, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to whether or not the defendant act in self-defense, you must find her not guilty. Flight. The flight of a person accused of a crime is a circumstance which, when considered with all the facts of the case, may justify an inference of guilt. Flight is the voluntary withdrawal of oneself for the purpose of evading arrest or prosecution for a crime charge. Whether the evidence presented beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant fled is a question for your determination. The law makes no precise distinction as to the manner or method of flight. It may be open or it may be hurried or concealed departure, or it may be concealment within the jurisdiction. However, it takes both a leaving the scene of the difficulty and a subsequent hiding out, evasion, or concealment of the community, or a leaving of the community for parts unknown to constitute flight. If flight is proven, the fact that flight alone does not allow you to find the defendant guilty of the crime alleged. 
However, since flight by a defendant may be caused by a consciousness of guilt, you may consider the fact of flight, if flight is so proven, together with all the other evidence when you decide the guilt or innocence of the defendant. On the other hand, an entirely innocent person may take flight, and such flight may be explained by proof offered or by facts and circumstances of this case. Whether there, were, whether there was flight by the defendant, the reasons for it, and the way to be given it are questions for you, the jury, to determine. Evidence has been introduced in this trial of a statement or statements by the defendant made outside the trial to show an admission against interest. An admission against interest is a statement by the defendant which acknowledges the existence or truth of some fact necessary to be proven to establish the guilt of the defendant or by which tends to show the guilt of the defendant or as evidence of some material fact, but not amounting to a confession. While this evidence has been received, it remains your duty to decide if in, in fact such statement was ever made. If you believe a statement was not made by the defendant, you should not consider it. If you decide the statement was made by the defendant, you must judge the truth of the facts stated. In so determining, consider the circumstances under which the statement was made, and also consider whether any of the other evidence before you tends to contradict the statement in whole or in part. You must not, however, arbitrarily disregard any part of the statement, but rather should consider all the statements you believe were ma was made and is true. You, the jury, are the sole judge of what weight should be given to such statement. If you decide a statement was made, you should consider it with all the other evidence in this case in determining the defendant's guilt or innocence. During the trial, you heard the expert testimony of the following individuals who were described to us as experts in their respective fields. Linda Littlejohn, a forensic scientist, microanalysis with the TBI. Amy McMaster, an anatomical and clinical forensic pathology, chief medical examiner for Davidson County. Dabney Kirk, forensic scientist, latent fingerprints with the TBI. Bradley Everett, forensic scientist, DNA and serology with the TBI. And Jerry Finley, blood stain pattern analysis and crime scene reconstruction. The rules of evidence provide that scientific or technical or other specified knowledge might assist in the jury in understanding the evidence or in determining the fact and issue. A witness qualifies expert by reason of special knowledge, skill or experience may testify and state her, his or her opinions concerning such matters and give reasons for their testimony. Merely because an expert witness has expressed an opinion does not mean, however, that you are bound to accept that opinion. The same as with any other witness. It's up to you to decide whether you believe the testimony and you choose to rely upon it. Part of that decision will depend upon your judgment about whether the witness's background or training and experience is sufficient for the witness to give the expert opinion you heard. You must also decide whether the witness's opinions were based upon sound reasons, judgment, and information. You are to give the testimony of an expert witness such weight and value as you think it deserves, along with all the other evidence in the case. A stipulation is an agreement. The parties have stipulated that certain matters of fact are true, they are bound by these agreements, and in your consideration of evidence you are to treat these facts as proven. One, that Miss Madden and Miss Stewart were roommates at Raiders Crossing Apartments in the fall of 2010 and the spring of 2011. Two, that the decision to place Miss Madden and Miss Stewart as roommates was a decision made solely by the management of Raiders Crossing Apartment, and that neither Miss Madden nor Miss Stewart requested to be assigned as roommates. And three, that there was tension which existed between Miss Madden and Miss Stewart during the spring semester of 2011, as evidenced by their conduct of the parties and the tweets of Miss Stewart. You've been presented evidence in the forms of postings taken from the Twitter account of Miss Tina Stewart, and those were on Exhibits 171 and 191. These postings are offered for the sole purpose of tending to establish a timeline for evidence relevant in the case. These postings, which are the words and phrases in the postings, are hearsay. Hearsay evidence is not recognized as reliable evidence, as hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered in the court and not subject to cross-examination. Additionally, the person who the postings are attributed to is not a witness in this case, and you cannot examine the credibility of the person who made those postings. The postings are in forms of writing, and as such you are not able to see or hear the demeanor of the person who made the posting. Therefore, you are instructed that you are to consider the postings for the sole purpose of whether or not they intended to establish a timeline of relevant events in this case. 
You are further instructed that their only relevancy in this case is whether or not they tend to establish a timeline of events and are not to be considered and not to consider the postings for any other purpose. The court charges you that the identity of the defendant must be proven in this case on the part of the state to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, the burden of proof is on the state to show you that the defendant now in trial before you is the identical person who committed the alleged crime with which she is charged. In considering the identity of a person, the jury may take into consideration all the facts and circumstances in the case. The court further charges you that if you're satisfied from a whole from the whole proof in the case beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime charged against her and you're satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that she's been identified as a person who committed the crime charge, then it would be your duty to convict her. On the other hand, if you're not satisfied with the identity from the proof or if you have a reasonable doubt as to whether she's been identified from the whole body of proof in the case, then you should return a verdict of not guilty. At times during the trial, I've ruled upon the admissibility of evidence. You must not concern yourself with these rulings. Neither by such rulings, these instructions, nor any of the remarks which I've made, do I mean to indicate any opinion as to what the facts or as to what the verdict should be. Statements, arguments, and remarks of counsel are intended to help you in understanding the evidence and applying the law, but they are not evidence. If any statements were made that you believe were not supported by the evidence, you should, you should disregard them. Some of you may have taken notes during the trial. Once you retire to the jury, you may refer to your notes, but only to refresh your memory of the witness's testimony. You are free to discuss the testimony of the witnesses with your fellow jurors. But each of you must rely upon your own individual memory as to what a witness did or did not say. In discussing the testimony, you may not read your notes to your fellow jurors or otherwise tell them what you've written. You should never use your notes to persuade or influence other jurors. Your notes are not evidence. Your notes should carry no more weight than the unrecorded recollection of another juror. If a question arises during your deliberations and you need further instructions, please print your question on a sheet of paper, knock on the door of the jury room right over there, and give the question to my court officer, Ms. Kimbrough. I will read your question and I may call you back into the courtroom or try to help you, but please understand that I may only answer questions about the law and I cannot answer questions about the evidence. You can have no prejudice or sympathy or allow anything but the law and the evidence to have any influence upon your verdict. You must render your verdict with absolute fairness and impartiality as you think justice and truth dictate. When you retire to the jury room, you'll first select one of your members as a foreperson who will preside over your deliberations. When you've reached a verdict, you'll return with it to this courtroom. Once again, you'll knock on the door, tell Ms. Kimbrough you've got a verdict, and then she'll take time to bring all of us in here at that time. The verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror, in, and your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with, with a view to reach an agreement if you can do so without violence to individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of your opinion of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. Also, some of you asked questions during the trial. If I rejected your question because it was not relevant or not allowed to be asked under our rules of evidence, you certainly are not to consider it as a negative reflection on you in any way. Just like if I reject a lawyer's question, it certainly is not a negative reflection on them in any way. I'm just required to follow the law in regard to that. If you find the state has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find her guilty. In that event, your four person report that you found the defendant guilty and will name the offense agreed upon. On the other hand, if you find the state's not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defense guilt, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to her guilt, then you must find her not guilty. In that event, your four-person report that you find the defendant not guilty. And after we have closed arguments, then the jury could retire for its deliberations. Also, I have just some suggested rules to assist you in regard to your deliberation. Uh, you're not required to follow these rules. These are just select uh, suggestions. 
They talk about how to get organized. They talk about preparing topics for discussion. They talk about discussing topics. They talk about debating on the verdict uh, and finally voting on the verdict. And the next document you will look at is the verdict form, and you'll be required to fill that out, and your four person will be required to find, uh, sign it. We, the jury, find as follows to, as to the defendant, Ms. Madden. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, or we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser-included offense of second-degree murder, or we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser-included offense of voluntary manslaughter, or we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser-included offense of reckless homicide, or we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser-included offense of criminally negligent homicide, or we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. So you would check the appropriate box which represents the verdict in the account of this indictment. And after you made your decision on that, the full person will sign and date it. As I said, if you're unable to reach a unanimous verdict, you would notify Ms. Kimbrough. Then to page two, that verdict form, we, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant, Ms. Madden. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence, or we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser-included offense of attempted tamper with evidence, or we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Now, Mr. White, or Mr. Newman, are there any additions or deletions you'd like me to make in regard to these jury instructions? No, Your Honor. Ms. Kimbrough, let me give this to you. <coughs> Ms. Marnie's make just a couple of changes. And Mr. Brandy, any additions or deletions in regard to the jury instructions? Yes, sir. Okay. Closing arguments. Mr. Newman. 